جمعوا جميع الرجال والتلاميذ الكبار هذول ما كانوا ثوار كانوا مزارعين اول يوم ثاني يوم مات واحد so you were trying to resist the British and they shot you for this they came with 30 other people from the uh, nearby village and they put them on the bus and uh, they forced the driver to drive on the second mile. We went in and I remember we had lighted braziers and we set the houses on fire and we burnt the village to the ground. A guardian of law and order looks out over the old walled city of Jerusalem. This is the story of what the 1930s newsreels didn't show a history of abuses inflicted by Britain in Palestine, and an attempt by Palestinians today to get the government to answer for them. You have to look hard to find al Basa, all that remains of a Palestinian village in what became northern Israel. It was destroyed in the year the state was created. So much of the history just feels lost, really. I mean, this... Uh, destruction, these ruins are from the war of 1948. And it was a decade earlier that the British were here and attacked and burned down houses. In 1938, after four of their troops were killed by a roadside bomb, the British machine gunned al Basa and then carried out a massacre. Men were herded onto a bus and blown up by a landmine, leaving many dead the remains buried in a pit. My father, he was afraid because, uh, as he says, they uh, strip people naked in front of everyone, and this is very shameful in our tradition, and they tortured them. Eid Haddad is a Palestinian refugee now in Denmark. His parents survived but never forgot the British attack on their village. And they wanted people to know that. My parents, as teenagers, they suffered. And people have to know what happened. And those who died, we have to speak for them now. Armored cars with reinforced screens patrol the road from Jerusalem. Violence between Palestinians and Jews was spiraling in the 30s. Britain struggled to contain an insurgency, the Arab Rebellion. Its response was brutal. Whole Palestinian villages were told they'd be punished for the crimes of the few. It went from here and it went from there. So you were a 13-year-old boy shot then. I mean, what, what happened after that? I was a hero. <laughs> <laughs> Munib al-Masri is heading the call for the UK government to apologise for alleged war crimes against Palestinians. He's taking a 300-page file of evidence to London. People being beaten, uh, houses being destroyed. I think. Britain should be brave to say, sorry, I did this, like they did in other countries. We used to go out before dawn, ring the village, tell them that nobody was to leave, and if anybody left, they were shot. These are the voices of British soldiers recorded decades later. The tapes reveal accounts of arbitrary killings, collective punishment, and torture. We all gathered round, formed two lines of men. And the rebels were sent one at a time through this, what do you call it, gauntlet. And they were belted and bashed until they got to the other end. Now, any that died, they went into the other meat wagon and they were dumped at one of the villages on the outside. Here in Halhul, in the occupied West Bank, you won't find plaques or memorials. There have been too many traumas to count in the years since Britain left for that. It was the summer of 1939 when Blackwatch troops surrounded the village and soldiers stormed in. The British were determined to find guns. They rounded up the men of Hal Hall and brought them here to a space behind a mosque. They forced men into cages. And the plane circled the village to target anyone who might try and run away. Up to 14 people died of dehydration in the cage where villagers were held for a fortnight it was described in an extraordinary account decades later by a British officer. In the bad cage, which was adjacent, they had no shelter. 
they were rationed to, I think, one pint of water a day, half a pint in the morning and half a pint in the evening. The idea was that, and they were told, that if they had a rifle, that if they gave it up, they would be put in a good cage. Marhaba, salam alaikum, shukran. Mohammed was a boy and remembers the soldiers occupying his rooftop. Palestinians and Israelis view the British legacy from very different positions. Three decades after its pledge for a Jewish homeland, the UK knew war was coming to Palestine. And both communities had felt Britain's broken promises. After the Holocaust, uh, the tension between the Zionists and the British uh, increased very badly. And so, historically, you might say that the British sometimes were quite nasty to both Jews and Arabs. They, they were very tough rulers, and what they wanted was, be quiet, don't bother us with your, with your problems. In a statement, the Ministry of Defence said it was aware of historical allegations and would review any evidence thoroughly. I mean, that is why it's been hard actually researching this story, to often to find the descendants of people who have the memories of what happened here because uh, their homes were destroyed in 1948 and then the community was scattered. And I think that's what, one of the key reasons why the people bringing the case feel that the British government owes this debt to the Palestinians because what happened here has never been accounted for. There is an argument that all of this should be laid to rest, that like the ruins of Albassa, underlying it are remnants of British rule, the ghosts of imperialism. But those requesting the acknowledgement argue it matters still. It reopens the debate over bringing modern day accountability for colonial era crimes and that recognizing the injustice of the past can help bring better solutions to it today.